1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Now, our Chaplain's Report today actually comes from the book of Ezekiel. We are going to, for a brief period, just forego our series on 1 Samuel. I'll probably get right back to it on Thursday, but I was going through some personal Bible reading. I'm reading through the major prophets right now, and I went and I found Ezekiel, and I got to tell you, I just had to sort of have a stop the presses moment. I've got to do a Chaplain's Report on this because it's so timely, so relevant. I, I mean, it just blew my mind how these verses just relate so closely to what we've been talking about for the past several days. And this particular passage is Ezekiel talking about false prophets. So to set the stage a little bit, Ezekiel is one of the very few prophets of God that are left. And the vast majority of the people that are prophesying, that are talking to the kings and the princes and the rulers in Israel, they're false prophets. They claim to be of God, but they're not. They basically got into the position that they are by telling the people, uh, both in high places and the regular people, the, the regular Joe Schmo that's working and just trying to feed his family, they told all of those people the things that they wanted to hear. They basically scratched the itch that they needed to, to tell them about all this good news. And they've also been corrupt, taking bribes, all of these things. They are, they're kind of the Joel Osteen <laughs> of ancient Israel in that sense, that they're just saying things that will tickle the person's ears but aren't actually truth. And this is one of the big criticisms that we find in Ezekiel. We'll look at chapter 13, verses 22 through 23. Because you disheartened the righteous with falsehood, when I did not cause him grief, but have encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way and preserve his life, therefore you women will no longer see false visions or practice my divination, and I will deliver my people out of your hand. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. So when we look at that verse, there are two really big condemnations by God. And the first one is disheartening the righteous with falsehood. So this one's pretty self-explanatory. It's just somebody that intentionally tries to dishearten uh, tries to take away the hope or the, uh, the joy of somebody that is a good person, somebody that attacks that which is good and tries to prevent them or tries to discourage them from doing that good. It's really not hard to see why these false prophets would have been engaging in this in the time of Ezekiel. Because if you're a false prophet, nothing makes you look like a false prophet more than an actual prophet. And so if that right message is out there that contradicts the message that you've been peddling to these people, you got to figure out a way to get rid of them or to discredit them or to do something. And this is what they are being told. This is why God is angry with them. Because what they have done is they have gone to the righteous people, the ones that are actually trying to do what God is telling them to do and trying to silence them telling them, shut up, no, we don't want to hear you, you're not saying the right thing. They're trying to discourage these people from doing what God wants them to do. So it's not just that they're doing the wrong thing, they are trying to find other people that are trying to do the right thing and stop them from doing it. This is what God is angry about right there. And you'll notice at the end of that he says, when I did not cause them grief. Remember that God chastises people. God chastises people all the time. And sometimes God allows even really horrible, terrible things to happen to people that he loves and wants the best for. I mean, essentially the entire book of Job is a case study in that. But here is an occasion where God is saying, you are attacking my people. You are disheartening them and discouraging them at a time where I didn't want that to happen, at a time where I need them to be encouraged. And for this, you are going to pay a price. And then the second half of this, where he says that the other big gripe that God has with these people, the second part of this, is that you encourage the wicked. 
And he specifically mentions two different ways how they've encouraged the weak, wicked. First of all, he said that they have been encouraged to do evil, or sorry, to continue to do evil by not turning from their evil ways. So the, the way that the verse reads in verse 22, it says, you have encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way. So in other words, here you are, on the one hand, all the people that are godly and righteous and trying to do what God tells them to do, you're trying to discourage them, you're trying to push them off to the side, saying, no, 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 you don't need to do that, and you know, you're know you going to face a penalty for this, and they're trying to dishearten those people, discourage them from doing the right thing, while simultaneously encouraging the wicked people, referring to them as good, saying, yes, do this, stirring them up. Um, basically allowing them to do this wickedness and not just allowing, actually encourage them to do the things that God doesn't want them to do. And then the second part of that is by preserving their life. Now, it's important to understand that this is contingent upon a biblical principle because these were judges and prophets. And because of that, what he says by preserving their life, he's saying, these people are doing wicked, and you are not killing them. That's what God is angry about. That they are doing things that, according to the law of Moses, are worthy of death. And these perverse judges are encouraging them in their wickedness and not punishing them because of it. This is what God is angry about. That they are essentially trying to punish the good and reward the evil. That they are encouraging them to do this and that they are neglecting their duty to speak out against it and to go one step further and punish those that are engaged in breaking God's law. Now, this isn't, you know, talking about vigilante justice or anything. These are people that are in positions of power that are supposed to be orchestrating this kind of thing. This would be like the police officers punishing and chastising those who are not doing anything wrong and just completely leaving alone people that are supposed to face legal penalties because of what they're doing. This is something that's rooted all the way back in Genesis. Even before the law of Moses, all the way back in Genesis, God deems when Cain kills Abel that if a man sheds blood, then his blood will be shed. That there is going to be a recompense for harming the innocent. And this is what they are not doing. I don't know if it's murder specifically or physical injury specifically that is being talked about in Ezekiel, although there are other passages in Ezekiel that actually do suggest that is what is going on. But the point is, there is evil that is being done, and they are refusing to carry that to its ultimate uh, punishment that God has ordained through the law of Moses that they should face. Does this not all sound like it was written today? The chastisement that is going on here by God is saying that the way that your society in Israel is working now, the way that your justice system and those that are charged with keeping my laws are operating is that they are punishing those that are trying to do the right thing and trying to preserve the life and not punishing those that are doing evil. I mean, you need only go back to, uh, you don't even have to go that far back into the past. Remember that just a couple months ago, we were having government officials that were shutting down churches, finding them imprisoning their ministers and their church leaders for daring to have a worship service when the state said, no, you can't do that. And then those same localities, those same jurisdictions are looking at people burning down buildings and har uh, killing people in some cases, and just not prosecuting, not doing anything, telling the police to back off. I mean, if, if this couple of verses is not a microcosm of where America is right now, I don't know what it is. And that scares the mess out of me, because you know what actually happens to Israel when they continued in this behavior? God punished them as a nation, as a whole. The retribution was swift, and it was terrible. And I'm genuinely scared for my country. I reflect the sentiment of Thomas Jefferson when he said, I tremble for my country when I remember that God is just, and his justice will not sleep forever. We are seeing this play out in the streets of this country every single day, and have for over a hundred days now. And I'm getting more scared because I remember that God's justice does not sleep for very long. 
It may take it a few years. It may not be as swift as we would like it, but it does come, and it comes with a vengeance when it does. But the thing that I think really struck me more than anything is that it also reminds me of the passages in Isaiah where Isaiah warns his people of calling good evil and evil good. And we've been doing that for a while now. We're calling two, uh, two men or two women getting together and, and making a mockery out of the God-ordained institution of marriage. We're saying that that is good. We're saying a four-year-old that is a boy that thinks he's a girl and his parents encouraging him to have surgery that will maim his body for the rest of his life. We're calling that good. And we're calling a 35-year-old man being able to enter a bathroom filled with little girls. We're calling that good. We're trying to, in some circles, even justify pedophilia and calling that good. We're referring to the destruction of the nuclear family and Western civilization. We're calling that good. But we're calling meeting together and worshiping and singing praises to God. That's bad. We can't have that. We have to punish people for doing that. Guys, it feels like we're living in biblical times. And I'm genuinely worried about it. But here's the reason that for all my worry, for all seeing the, the signs on the wall and, and hoping that that's not what comes to pass, here's the reason why even though I am genuinely concerned about it, I know that ultimately it's not going to be the end of the world. It's not going to be the end of the church. It's not going to be that we don't win this eventually because of the end of that verse. Because what do you see at the end of verse 23? He says that I will deliver my people out of your hand. That's it. No commentary. Not God telling us how he's going to do it or the way that he's going to do it. Just, I will deliver my people out of your hand. Those that are righteous, those that are good, those that are following me, those I will protect and I will deliver them out of your hand to where you can't hurt them anymore. Now, whether he does it on this side of eternity or the next, I don't know. But I have absolute 100% confidence that for those that are following God, they will be delivered out of the hands of those that are chastising them. They will be delivered out of the hands of these false prophets that are pretending to be on the side of the angels while promoting something that is demonic. I know that for a fact as sure as I am sitting here. And the very last part of that verse, right after God makes that promise, thus you will know that I am the Lord. Even the people that are doing this, even the people that are calling light dark and dark light, the people that are promoting these kinds of things, those people eventually will know that God is God. They're not going to like it. They're not going to be happy about it. They're going to have to admit that they were wrong, but they are going to know that God is God. That is going to happen regardless of what they think about it. So when God does this deliverance, when he protects them, and those that are called by his name, his people, those that are in his kingdom, are delivered out of this tribulation, even the bad guys are going to know that God is real and that he is the Lord. And regardless of all the craziness and, and the insanity and the immorality that is going on around us, we can rest assured in that, and that is the antidote to any worry or anxiety we're feeling about it. Yes, the world is insane right now, and there are very, very bad people trying to do very, very bad things, and they're specifically targeting us, targeting God's people, and rewarding those that are evil and encouraging them to do so. Yes, all of that is happening. God still reigns. And ultimately, that is the only thing that is going to matter, that he is the Lord. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Hey, if you liked this video, then you should press the like button. I mean, that's literally what it's there for. If you liked the video but didn't hit the like button, then it's like getting great service but not tipping your waiter. Except liking is free, and so is subscribing and hitting the notification bell. So if you're enjoying my content but not liking my video, there's really only one explanation. It's because I'm black, isn't it?